When first meeting John, I got the impression that this is an individual that has pursued a life calling unlike any other. Several other lasting impressions are created when you enter his unique world. A crowded apartment which is bursting at the seams with electronic equipment from floor to ceiling. In the bedroom, the kitchen and the living room. A decor that would give the Martha Stewart mindset night terrors. Basically it's very, very, very selected um, military Navy surplus equipment and it's used for RF generation and um, RF monitoring, uh, radio frequency production, analyzing the, the signals and actually putting them back out in transmission forms and that. So a lot of this stuff is uh, used in, well, in experiments that uh, caused me some rather interesting adventures. Experimenting with the electromagnetic field is the key to several of John's discoveries. One of them is called the Crystal Energy Converter, or Power Cell, which seems to produce sustainable electricity from the air around us. The technology itself was, again, the Casimir yes. Cavity Resonances, using um, roughly about 30, 25 to 30 millimeter diameter crystal wafers of different materials like silicon, germanium, and many other wafers that were inside a tube. And this tube was, of course, enclosed with a micrometer feed. And on the outside of that was a barium titanate cylinder, which has um, got piezoelectric properties, and it resonates at um, 18 kilohertz. Um, this thing turns into like a supercapacitor. So when this started to, to work like this, this, is this uh, barium cylinder, barium titanate cylinder, would amplify the energy and then I would get a, a crude form of direct current. So this inspired me to build up on it with good engineering practices and build a very large one. John gave a demonstration of his portable crystal converter at the end of a successful 1995 Japanese lecture tour on new energy in Hiroshima. Um, I did my demonstration. I had two TV cameras on me and there was um, a third at a distance covering all of this and um, I decided I gave the demonstration it worked fine then I decided without even doing any of this take everything all apart just destroy it this is my end demonstration time to destroy the thing <laughs> so I took it all apart and the TV people were got in there with their lights and all that and checked everything and there's no batteries since there is no visible source of energy generation, these devices are running into resistance from the current scientific thought. They seem to be violating physics' first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy, which means that you can't get more energy out than you put in. That's why this new energy discovery is perceived as the old idea of perpetual motion creating energy from nothing in a finite closed system. The theory in quantum mechanics proposes that such devices operate in an open system, harnessing the energy present in the vastness of space. It is believed that the crystal converter works on the principles of the Casimir effect. In 1948, Dutch physicist Hendrik Casimir discovered an effect to release heat using small charged plates that utilized fluctuations of the electromagnetic field at a very high frequency. This new energy source appears in the equations of quantum mechanics as early as 1925. Today it is called the zero-point energy field. It produces jitter with fluctuations of electricity in the atoms of molecules at zero degrees Kelvin, the point in which molecules are supposed to cease movement. Zero-point energy is difficult to measure and validate because it interacts with all elementary particles. By resisting conventional wisdom, John has continued with his efforts to produce a simple solid-state power cell from his adjustable prototype. The plates have to be charged, and they have to move together. That's a bit of a problem. The moving them together, I would use a tunable um, micrometer. And, but after a while, these, these, all these little plates would break down because of the heat and distortion and the pressure from the, from the um, little micrometer. 
So I had to think that what else could I do to have something that is usable, practical. Then I thought of maybe taking all kinds of, almost like a dust of plates, platelets of germanium and other metals, and mixing them in, into a mineral mix with great heat to get any hydrous material out of them. And also at the same time, as it's all cooling down, I would apply 20,000 volts direct current, then dropping it down to 45 uh, volts direct current. So the mem they're memorized. John continues to refine the development of his power cell with the help of modest foreign investment. He's been able to reduce the size of the converters to those of conventional household batteries. Once perfected, the crystal matrix can be seamlessly integrated to any device that requires electrical energy. The changes could be revolutionary. It's even hard to conceive of um, because it's so vast. It can incorporate all aspects of um, electronics, propulsion, um, transportation. For the environment, it would create more industry in, in changing over from fossil fuels into more modern vehicles for transportation and that. So it would create a lot more jobs. Basically, we're dealing with a zero emission problem uh, and actually using natural materials to harness this energy, meaning basically just minerals. When it comes down to the technology, it's exotically simple in, in production. And it's uh, also, it's uh, factory compatible. Zero point energy is a hot topic in certain small scientific circles. Recent developments in quantum physics indicate a possible massive energy source. It's been calculated that um, one sugar cube size or one cubic inch, or Hal Pudoff says one cubic foot um, of it, of the space time right here now, right in front of us, around us, if you can capture that, there's enough energy in that um, block to um, power the Earth's energy needs for 100 years. Richard P. Feynman. Uh, Nobel Prize winner states a light bulb size piece. A U.S. patent was issued on technology based on this energy source. This is a significant event because the U.S. Patent Office clearly states it will not issue a patent for something it deems to be perpetual motion. There, it's interesting to note that uh, my competitor in, in this has a U.S. patent already, uh, Dr. Franklin Mead, who does know my research. And if one was to study that patent um, through the United States Patent Office, one would see it's in very interestingly similar to my stuff. As the application for a patent draws near, there is still much research and development required. Since the lack of interest by Canadian scientific institutions is clearly evident, a growing foreign interest will most likely provide the financial impetus to bring this discovery to fruition. At least Canadians will be able to breathe easier, knowing this technology will contribute to a cleaner environment.